Kai versus the world. All right, guys, welcome to the Only Games podcast, where all we talk about is games, mainly indie games, indie devs, and the amazing games they produce. Here we have Squid Shot Studios, uh, two amazing developers. We have Chris and Trevor, and they have an amazing game called Bo that's coming out soon. They already have a Kickstarter out and a Steam page. So, guys, go ahead and introduce yourselves to this awesome audience. Well, first of all, my name's Chris. I am the creative director of Bo. And to my right, I have... I am Trevor, and I'm the lead programmer of Bo. Yeah, and I also wanted to add that we're the core team, but we have two people who are also working with us. Moises Camargo and Mikami Art, who do the music and the animations, respectively. Awesome. And I got to say, like, your team... I have a lot of questions to ask about that, but like music and animation. And that's one thing that drew me to this game was just the sheer beauty of the game itself and how it just automatically just brings you in, like emotionally brings you into the game. So you're four, only four people on your team that make this game. Yeah, that's correct. Wow. That's, that's, that's amazing. I love that. I love that so much. So uh, what are some of the, what are some games that influence the development of Bo? Because the one game that comes to mind when I saw it was Hollow Knight, which is like a masterpiece game. But this game has like a unique pen on paper animation so, aesthetic. So what's, what are some games that really made you, influenced your development of the game? Well, you're definitely correct on the Hollow Knight influences. Mm -hmm. And I think all of, we get a lot of um, commentary about how it reminds players of Hollow Knight. It looks like Hollow Knight. Is mm -hmm. this a Hollow Knight mod? Yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> um, and it's kind of inevitable um, that we would be influenced by Hollow Knight. Hollow Knight's kind of inspired a ton of um, game developers who are coming up now, mm -hmm. just because of the sheer success of this title, and especially because it was an indie title. Um, and the community that's grown around that game has become immense. And I don't think the indie world has ever seen anything quite like that, with the exception of maybe um, Undertale or... I think that's about it. That's the only fan base that could really compare in size. Um, so we were super inspired by Hollow Knight. Um, not so much the gameplay, the gameplay as um, sorry, the way the gameplay works, but definitely the aesthetic vibe of it. It's kind of moody, atmospheric, and it has a heavy emphasis on the characters. So we were inspired in that way, and of course the hand-drawn art style that it employs. Right. But um, aside from the obvious Hollow Knight, we were also inspired by Okami. Oh, nice. Which, yeah, it's a little bit of an older game. I think it's 2008. I, I'm not exactly sure, but Game GameCube uh, title. Recently released in HD for like different platforms. And it, and it has a very uh, Japanese, traditional Japanese aesthetic mm -hmm. where they are using heavy ink stroke shaders to like make it look like it's all pa a painting. And I, when I saw that game, I hadn't played it, but when I saw that game, it was... It blew my mind. Like I didn't know that video games could look like this. Right. The art direction was absolutely inspired by something mm -hmm. that no one, no other game has ever really explored visually. So the, these beautiful hand drawn, uh, you kind of yeah, like I said, you feel like you're in a traditional Japanese painting when you're playing that game. Exactly. And that's uh, the first thing I thought about. Like you know those those uh, paintings that people put on their walls or the scrolls, the wall scrolls put them on the walls, where it's like it looks kind of cartoonish, but still like someone like took time. The pink stinkily, like just draw it, like from from pit from from, from like table to wall, like that's what it looks like. And I see all the all the you know the, the graphics and whatnot in the background, and it looks so beautiful. It's like a moving Japanese wall scroll as a game. It's, a, it's insane. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that was a an aesthetic that we really wanted to uh, employ in Bo, and a lot of the design decisions kind of are uh, informed by how Okami did things. What about you, Trevor? Uh, yeah, and. Yeah, Trevor, Trevor, go for it. Oh yeah. Uh, so for for more of the the platforming influences of Bo, um, I'd say the the main influence for that would have to go to Celeste and some of the Messenger as well. Um, yeah, I, I just really love the super tight, precise platforming you get with Celeste, um, and it's super fun. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, yeah so. Oh, go ahead. Also, a game called Dust Force that maybe people don't really know as much oh, about. Oh, yeah, Dust Force. That came out a while ago. I remember that game. Yes, yeah, that's, that's an yeah. oldie. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. not really, but. 
you know, in indie game terms, maybe it's like a bit of an oldie. Right, like 2014, 2015, like old school game in the indie world. Yeah. So we loved the, the movement in that. So we try to emulate that a little bit. Speaking of, uh, of Celeste, I'm, I'm assuming you both played Celeste. How many times did you guys like rage quit that game? <laughs> oh, oh I, I never rage quit it. I, I love Celeste so much. That's probably yeah. one of my favorite games. It's an amazing game. Yeah. Uh, me, I, I actually haven't beat it yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I have it on computer and Switch, and I just uh, I can't get past the, you know, when you start having to use those blocks that move side to side, you have to like dash yes. into them. Yes. Um, that, that part kind of drove me nuts. Um, oh, that, that's like the funnest part, though. It is. Sure. It's very yeah. fun. But, <laughs> like it's, it's fun, but then like that's the part where I got stuck for like I think like two days, two three days. I think I streamed like I streamed that game like three years ago, and I was just sitting there. And, and the thing is that 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 whole mechanic is cool. It's fun. It builds. It's like a building block kind of game where it gets more and more difficult at the negative zone. But my goodness, because it's so unforgiving. The game is is amazing, fun to play, and has a great story and a really cool characters. But yeah, I raged quite a few times. Beautiful. In that game. It really did. Beautiful game. <laughs> it is. Um, like, I'm a huge music buff. So when, in games, I do feel like music pulls it all together. Like if you have great characters, great story, even if you don't have that, if you have a great music with characters saying nothing like in Greece, like that tells the whole story of the game. That's one thing that drew me to Bo. So, and I've heard, I've heard in the trailers, the preview videos you guys put up on Twitter. So um, also the environments are crazy, are incredible too. And the animation. So what made you decide to make Japanese folklore the main theme of Bo? Well, it was honestly a little bit of an accident. Um, we, there was, before we even thought about game dev, I was like playing games and stuff. And I found this cool game jam game called In Cleaning the System. And you control this little rod and it kind of bounces. And I'm like, mm, this idea could be developed further somehow. It, it was fun. And there was a lot of speed running potential in it. So I thought about how we could make that into a more fleshed out narrative. So I'm like, okay, it kind of looks like a staff with two bouncy ends. So let's make a character who uses a bow staff as its weapon and use employ kind of a bouncy airborne type mechanic. And obviously the bow staff kind of is very tied to uh, East Asian cultures, Chinese and Japanese. Um, but in particular, I'm actually half Japanese myself. Okay. My mother's Japanese and I grew up kind of around vaguely kind of around that culture of course i grew up in america but i've been to japan several times and i have family in japan friends in japan and uh i love that country i love that culture the, everything from the architecture to obviously the artwork and stuff so i think it was a very natural progression for our game to employ that aesthetic and yeah that that's about it that's about it how about you uh, trevor uh well before i worked on Bo at all. I had like no clue about anything about Japanese folklore. Like I, I didn't know anything, but um, I guess what, what made me, but even though I didn't know much about it, the fact that Chris wanted to go in that direction of Japanese folklore that pulled me into wanting to work on, on the game with him a lot more because I've never seen that explored really in a game before <laughs> and um yeah that's about it so i i i came in to Bo almost completely clueless on japanese folklore and it, it's honestly been super fun like researching um aspects of folklore of japanese folklore with chris like in developing this game and um yeah that's another thing like yeah. it's so rich like there's mm -hmm. so much to pull from um all the different yokai spirits that they have and the architecture and things like that. So while we are trying to be unique and change up the kind of, we're trying to stay true to tradition to a point, but we are trying to give a fresh spin on a lot of these characters just because I feel like we have a duty to kind of make it seem fresh. Cause like with um, with certain platform games, like there's, there's a ton of platform games, roguelike games, like they're done to death in, in the indie development world and in the AAA world as well. There's a ton of them out there. I always say if you can make your like your game, your platform game or your roguelike game unique in some way, which I feel like you have, like it's you've won. Like, that's and it is hard to make them make that kind of type of genre fresh for, you know, for people who've been playing the game, playing platform games all their lives. Like, from Mario till now. So I do think that guys sure. did a great job in like really creating your own world 
with Bo. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So from like the gameplay I've seen of Bo, like it looks like it's looks pretty intense. Like it's really intense. You know, like crazy <laughs> bosses, unique enemies. Like the one enemy like rolling with fire towards you. I was like, oh my goodness, that's nightmare fuel. Like that was really cool. Um, so how much of a challenge will this be for uh, the for the player? And what mechanics can they use to like dominate their opponent? Well, uh, when it comes to mechanics and defeating enemies, so uh, our main focus is to make it fun and to focus on fluid airborne movement. So, you know, our game is not a beat 'em up. So, uh, it's not the focus isn't explicitly explicitly on combat. And also with um a lot of many other mechanics we have, we we also focus on interacting with the environment and maneuvering um in the scene. Yeah, like, focusing like, on I know I saw oh, one, one of them was like the characters jumping and slashing different objects to get higher and higher on a, on a platform or in the air, kind of, kind of like um, like Celeste or like or in the blind forest, kind of like where it's like got to connect to certain things with the staff and your mechanics to get higher up or avoid enemy attacks. Right, it's a little bit more airborne than than Celeste. Mm -hmm. um, we really want the player to feel like they need to be staying in the air. Okay, and so like like Trevor said, it's not explicitly a focused on combat hmm. all of the combat is used in a or is employed in a way that helps you continue your airborne movement so every every object not every object but certain objects like projectiles and things will help you let you can latch on to them mm -hmm. and then use movement to get a little bit higher to get to this area and you can reset your jumps by attacking while you're in the air things like that um it's it's more about all all the combat's more about m gaining movement rather than just hack and slashing. Right, gotcha, okay, yeah. I saw like wall bouncing and like avoiding the pit of danger just by, by jumping on an enemy or using the head for like to bounce up and dash through. Like all those mechanics are really fun to use in platform games. But I saw that, that being used heavily in your game. It looks very interesting. It's always fun yeah. to do that too. There's always a challenge. There's certain, and do you have certain levels where it's like where difficult level of Celeste or other games where like you have to use what you learn over time to get out of the situation you have those kind of levels too well we haven't developed like some of the later stages that are going to get a little bit more intense yet okay you know what i mean mm -hmm. um we're, we're developing it kind of in chronological order to to a point so we haven't designed a lot of the more intricate uh levels yet but mm -hmm. yeah they're going to get quite intense you're going to have to chain abilities and take what you learned um you know we've been trying to teach you throughout the entire game or that's mm -hmm. our goal to teach you teach you teach you to a point where it doesn't become overwhelming and then when you get to this cool these cool challenges you get to use everything you you learned nice i like and, that a lot uh, it should feel really good yeah nice yeah i think like that's the best way to treat these kind of games right any kind of game where you know it's not like a tutorial like it's like tells you what to do and freezes the, the screen's like no just like show us what it is well exactly. show us some puzzles like a building block, and then we're like, oh yeah, I can use that ability. I learned the first level, but it's already in your head. Like, it's like muscle memory. So that's that's yeah, a really I'm a cool huge way. Proponent. Yeah, I'm a huge proponent of what you just said. Like, show, don't tell. Yes, exactly. You know? But to a certain point, you you need to tell something sometimes. Right. But your first inclination should be to naturally teach them how to do it in practice. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge. Uh, design a tenant that we try to employ so i feel like developers like they tend to pull in their real life experiences and implement them into their games so what were you able to implement into bow from like your real life experience well i think a lot of that you'll see in the characters dialogue and the characters stories the side mm -hmm. characters the npcs because bow himself uh herself himself bow's genderless but oh gotcha we'll, we'll use that pronoun. <laughs> but um um uh, Bo is not a speaking character. They're kind of the silent protagonist. But the NPCs... Hold on, my screen went black. Okay, yeah, the NPCs are all kind of quirky. They all kind of have problems. Uh, some, some, they, they're going through certain mental struggles. Mm -hmm. And we'll try to convey that through the dialogue as much as possible. And... I think a lot of people will relate to some of these characters and how they are. Like, for example, we have a character named Toshi. He's a he's like a herder who lives in a cave, kind of like a mushroom esque creature, <laughs> and uh, he kind of has anxiety issues. 
and he's very unsure of himself yeah. and feels like nobody loves him. And he, he kind of has a little bit of a dark past too. Um, but through talking to him and helping him, you're able to work through those struggles uh, of his of his anxiety and his, his self, self-assurance or lack thereof. Um, so it's really, we're going to project a lot of common mental struggles that people go through onto the NPCs and their side quests. That, that's awesome. I love hearing that. I love hearing like that, how like, that's, that's the thing that I love and enjoy about these kind of games and like indie development as a whole is that they take from the real world and put it in the game where it's enjoyable, but you also learn about like, mental health or about how people struggle and how they go about the day. And if you can help the NPCs, that even gives more depth to the, the background characters. I mean, the main, the main character is going to be the one that's focused on and has the most story, but you can give that kind of like fleshed out character, you know, personality to uh, background characters, NPCs. That's amazing. I mean, the whole game is yeah. so much more like fruitful to play. Yeah, it makes them feel more alive and real and that they exist beyond your interactions with them. Right. You know, if they have backstories, which is something we're really trying to do. We want to make, we want to make it feel like this world exists beyond your being in it. Like it's living and breathing. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. It makes it more immersive. And you, you always want to come back and play and like, like, like oh, I played the, run this far in the game, but I haven't talked to this person yet. To go back and talk to the person, see if there's any new na- dialogue to discover or just talk to them just to hang out with them, see, we, we learn more about that character. That's always cool. Exactly. Like that. You have anything to add, Trevor? Um, I guess on my end, um, I guess the, the main influence I, I have in the in the narrative of Bo, it would be like to inject a sense of wanderlust because I guess in, in my personal life, I've always, I've always um, suffered from intense wanderlust, just wanting to travel, wanting to discover new places. Mm. And I think with, with Bo, um, we're really trying to put that sense of wanderlust into the player. Like, oh, I really want to experience and discover this really mysterious Japanese kind of a, this new Japanese inspired world. That's awesome. Do you have any like, favorite places you've traveled over, the, over you know, your lifetime? <laughs> uh, well, number one would be Southeast Asia, but I'm kind of biased because that's where I'm living right now. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> um, I'd say that the place that's had the most impact on my development as an adult would be um, the city of Amsterdam in Europe, because that was like the first place that I, I traveled by myself, you know, like with my own money on mm-hmm. my own time. And it was, it just had a profound impact in how I saw the world at that time. Wow. So your first time yeah. tasting freedom and being on your own. Going around. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So we, we, we were in your twenties or you're younger, or just exploring everything and learning more things about the, the culture of Amsterdam or yeah, I, I was, I think it was like a few, yeah, it was like a week after my 21st birthday. Wow. That's when I went to Amsterdam. And yeah, I, I just really wanted to travel. Um, so I did it. Awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. It's always important to travel when you're, when you're young or just throughout your whole life. But traveling when you're young, it's like it's different because when you, when you have a family, you can, you can travel with them, it's fine, but it's, it's a little diff- more difficult to, you know, I guess, discover who you are different part of yourself without you know anyone around you it was fun oh abs- absolutely and and when you're younger too you don't have as many responsibilities yet so right. you have a lot more freedom to discover and try new things try new food um take more risks mm-hmm. so yeah you can't go zip lining down like you know over a huge ravine when you have kids at home you know waiting for you <laughs> like that's that's not like yeah. a smart decision to make but i would do it i would do it but you know i get in trouble for doing that yeah yeah. yeah, it gets a little sketchy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as an indie developer, uh, the struggle can be real at times, you know, develop, in the development process. So what are some things you guys do or recommend to fellow developers to do to relax you, to take your mind off of the whole creation process? I think, um, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I'll just, I'll just be short. Um, I think one of the things that I do is like, as a developer, you're on the computer all day. And this is like really, mm-hmm. it seems like really simple, practical advice, but mm-hmm. You need to get out. You need to go see a tree or something. <laughs> you need to go, yeah, at the very least, go see a tree. Yeah, um, you tree. need to get out and get some sun, uh, take a walk, 
So I've been trying to do that a little bit more. Of course, y you make excuses. You're like, oh, I need to work on this right now. I don't have time to go for a walk. Um, but those uh, walks in nature or connecting with nature really clear your head in a way that there's no substitute for. Mm -hmm. And um, th there's something about the human nature that you need to be outside. You need to be seeing like greenery. Um, it it's good for your mental health. Um, but yeah, like you said, the struggle is really real. Um, I don't think I've ever felt such immense pressure and uh, responsibility before I became a game dev. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And uh, and on my side, I, I can talk about it more from a programming um, point of view. So I guess I guess what I'll say it's more of um, it's more something to keep in mind if you're just programming a lot in general. And I'd say two things in my opinion. So one is to keep very soft deadlines. Now that doesn't mm -hmm. seem relaxing, but it actually it, it does something to your psychology if you keep like just short deadlines in your head of what of exactly what you want to get done in a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's a totally arbitrary deadline, it actually helps you out a lot. And just the second piece of advice I have is like, um, just make sure to take care of your mental health, you know, and that includes, you know, not eating terrible food for you every day. And as Chris said, you know, make sure to go outside, get some fresh air. Um, if you have a family, make sure you spend time with your family. Because mm. at the end of the day, like when your game's all done, you still have your whole entire life besides your game to go back to. So if you let that fall apart, as you're spending so much time on the game, then at the end of the day, it's not worth it. So you need to make sure that you, you know, you take care of your priorities and your mental health as well. Yeah, and if you didn't have mental health struggles before game dev, <laughs> you're gonna start hitting those. Uh, I oh, think yeah. anyone can, can uh, attest to that who's been doing this. I have a few friends who are uh, developing games like by themselves or with a bunch of other friends and the kind of things they put themselves through like some of them like go like 14 hours straight, just like coding and developing and writing. And it's like, you got to get outside and like, just put it down. It's always, it's always going to be there. That's not, and one thing I said, is like, you know, set soft deadlines, go out and touch a tree. Like, yes. Cause some people yeah. like go, some people, are, some of my friends are part of a, of companies where they have like strict deadlines where they have to meet it right here, no matter what. And they go over time and they don't see the families and they don't go anywhere. They plan trips, but they can't go. It's like, and they just, they're, they're so strung out and burnt out. It's like, you gotta like, it's jobs are a job. It's cool. You love what you do. It's great. But you have to take time for yourself and to relax. And yeah, definitely, absolutely hang with family and friends. Cause that's, that's, that's connection you need. Games are there. Jobs are there. But the family is like, you have almost so much time on this earth with the people you love. Right. Yes. So spend time with them and, and then push back some deadlines. If you can, that's, that's the most important thing. Cause for me, like right. my family is like my center for just relaxing and hanging out and bouncing things off of them and taking down my stress. So exactly. Yeah. That, that's, exactly. that's, that's, amazing, that's a great advice. I hope people, I hope everyone takes that to heart. Like you'll finish your game. It'll, it'll get finished. Just take time to, you know, take care of yourself. You can't work stress or work angry or work sad. Yeah, Bingo. exactly. Yeah. So here's a question what was the first game you guys created and what did you learn in the process? <laughs> well, our, our first game was actually a mobile game. It was called Fox Phrase. And that was really our first experience, <clears throat> like working together as developers of any kind. And I, th I think it, it went quite well um, when it came to like working together and getting the project done. Um, unfortunately, Fox Phrase, I had to take a back seat because like th we just had other things that we wanted to do and mm -hmm. we had to um we're not we're not done with fox phrase necessarily but it's it's pretty low priority at the moment and then the other it's like a i i guess you can call it a game it's a game jam okay, game fox phrase is available for download on google play if anyone wants to check it out it it's functional oh, yeah. it's just like we haven't been marketing it just because uh yeah like Bo just started getting traction and we're putting all of our effort mm -hmm. in into bow right now what kind of yeah. game is fox phrase uh it's a it's a catchphrase clone but the the difference is that it it has a fox okay as the, yeah. as the mascot that's mm -hmm. a very important one yeah. but um 
uh, aside from that, it it's it's community driven. So people are able to upload their own decks. Uh, for for if, if people don't know what catchphrase is, it's a word game where mm. that you can play in a group of friends, which is a game that I love. So I just wanted to make it more community driven, where people are able to upload their own decks mm. for certain niche categories like Pokemon or uh, League of Legends or things like that for nerds to check out and have fun with. Oh, cool. Okay. Okay. Oh, if I had a is it on PC too? Because I have, I have a, an iPhone. I don't have Android anymore. No, it's it's only on Android right now. Ah, dang. Uh, okay. Long story, but yeah, only Android for now. Okay. If anyone has Android, okay. you can look it up and download it and play it. Let me know how it is. Yeah. And Trevor, do you want to talk about... I cut you off, so... Oh, well, oh I was talking about Foxbat, right? Or yeah, I was about Fox. to talk about Foxbat. So, um, yeah, I guess you we can consider that a game. It's It was our Game Jam game. We made that in what was it chris may or june one of the two i don't remember okay yeah it was one of those months but um we we were we were still working on bow at the time but we decided that it would be good just for both of us to actually have um 48 so i'll explain a little bit what this game jam was it, mm -hmm. it was from this uh game makers toolkit game jam um it's it's this one YouTuber. His name's Game Makers Toolkit. I think, I think you probably heard of him, Kai, or ha have you heard of him before? Name, toolkit. Sorry, say it again. Oh, his name is or his channel is Game Makers Toolkit. No, I haven't heard that guy yet. Okay. Well, um, he yeah. So he he's a YouTuber that runs this game jam, and there's like thousands and thousands of entries in this game jam, and basically, <laughs> um, you have forty eight hours to come up with the game. Okay. That runs on Windows. And that's basically all. I'm sure there are some other rules that I'm missing out, but that's basically what it is. So, yeah, we just took a very stressful uh, 48 hours and we came out with a game jam game called Foxbat. Um, and we did that mostly to get into the rhythm of actually releasing a game and how it would feel to actually make a game and to put it out into the public. So it was, it was a success in that sense. But if anyone plays the game now, it's like the bugs are like yikes <laughs> on it. <laughs> I mean, you got to start somewhere, right? Like it, the first game's not going to be, you know, a masterpiece. So the fact that you guys started a game or made a game, that's, that's the first step. Of, yeah, the, exactly. Yeah, bigger picture. The, so yeah, the lessons that we, that we learned, the lessons that we learned were invaluable from that one game gem um, time. It's kind of like a hyperbolic uh, time chamber, if you know that reference from Dragon Ball Z. I do. I love like, anime. You, you get thrown into like this another dimension where you have to train super hard mm -hmm. in a super short amount of time, high stress situation. Uh, but then when you come out of it, you're like ten times stronger mm -hmm. because uh, because of all the stress, you know. <laughs> if you get through it, exactly. <laughs> I've seen those like game jams. The thing is, like most of them, I've been following are on Game Jolt or Itch.io, and I just see like all these like really cool games, like fully functional games that should be of, like full length types of Insane, titles. Right? It's it's crazy how talented people are from like the most like pixelated games, platform simple ones to like full fledged like hide and seek kind of horror games. Like it's like it's the kind of time and effort and dedication you guys put into those game jams is insane. I gotta say that right now. Yeah, it's, I... it's pretty cool that guys turn out there's no other word for it it's insane like the amount of variety and the amount of quality mm -hmm. oh god it's it's something really special if, if, if there's any game devs out there who have never done a game jam before do at least one it's it's a it is, it's an experience unlike anything else absolutely I, f I followed some developers from the, the first game jam game they've done to see how where they are now is is pretty incredible like two three years later so i think game jams do teach you how to work very fast under pressure and turn out some Games that you thought wouldn't be that great, but they're amazing. All, all of us who play them, so definitely. Hollow Knight, Hollow Knight started as a game jam. Ex game, exactly, actually, exactly. Yeah. Yes, it did. There's another one too so that's, that's being go. developed. It's called, it's called the Last Night. The first game, like the the game he made, like I think 48 hours or a month it took him to make, and then they got so popular on itch.io that they want to make a full length game. And he's still working on it, but it's still in you know development stasis. The question: What was your guys' um go to hobby in in 2020, when everything shut down, what do you guys do to keep yourselves busy? Well, actually, we we're in Thailand, so 
2020, actually, we didn't have the same kind of shutdowns that the rest of the world did, or at least mm. in America. Mm -hmm. So 2020 was a pretty normal year for us. Um, like, we, we, we didn't start Bo yet, though. Bo started development in, in 2021, okay. like early 2021. Uh, but in 2020, like, there wasn't much going on. But I guess I'll answer from when we did go into lockdown more in 2021. Uh, God, yeah. It was, it was hard on everybody. It was hard on me. It was hard on Trevor, I'm sure. And, you know, the rest of the global population. Mm -hmm. But I think working on Bo and, like, diverting to something that would, uh, you know, you know, if you're in, in your room all day, you can't really, like, go out and stuff. What do you naturally do? You get on your computer and try to do something productive. Yeah. Um, so that productive creative outlet for me has been working on this game, working with my community in a social way. Uh, you kind of have to shift onto the online world a little bit. So I think like 2021 was an insanely productive year, um, even in spite of all the terrible things that have been happening. I mean, not 2021, 20, oh yeah, 2021. God, is it already 2022? It is. Lose track of time. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I feel like 2020 and 2021 didn't even happen. We just kind of fast oh my forwarded God, to yeah. now. It just it zoomed a by. Fever dream. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Trevor? Anything you, you did in 2021 when things closed down? Uh, well, my answer is just kind of short and boring. I just programmed all the time because there's <laughs> nothing else to do. Yeah. Honestly. So, so uh, like all these languages and stuff. Well, yeah, that, that's like, you know, 2020 and 2021, that might have been a blessing in disguise for me, at least when it comes to my career as a programmer, because my skills got taken to the next level because basically I was doing that every day. And I ended up falling in love with it. So, yeah, I before Bo, I was doing like a hodgepodge of a ton of different little projects to just improve my skills, a lot of different languages. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so it was actually kind of fun for me. I mean, besides not traveling. That's, that's probably the thing I miss the most. And even still in Thailand, even though it's 2022, like, it's still pretty hard to travel like to let's say the beach in mm -hmm. thailand because you have to go through um, a lot of covid um covid protocols still so um there's still not much traveling done yet but besides that i'm just programming programming right yeah mine, mine was a uh, kind of half productive kind of not I, I pretty much reached the end of netflix uh and hulu watched every single series i could over and over again yeah got him with some anime but then again i did Heck yeah like, yeah then again i did like uh i, I watched like my favorite of all time called you know what's it um Full Metal alchemist brotherhood for me it's like the best anime oh. ever and i watch it every single year at least twice it's, it's just that good i still feel the same way every single time every plot point every discovery everything every twist same thing it's one of the best written animes of all time i watched that and i played a lot of games and i caught up on a lot of my indie games which i have been on the back burner from since 2019 so that was it was kind of productive, kind of productive. I did get out, walk around, and you know, I took some grass and hug the tree. For the most part, <laughs> that's great. I mean, that is productive as as long as like those things like inspire you and and push you to do like pursue creative creativity, creative endeavors, and, yeah. and that's what you do as a YouTuber, and uh, that's awesome. Exactly, and and I did also like I think advance my skills in like editing and just different kind of creation on Photoshop. So yeah, I just, I had a lot of time to my, on my hands to just do whatever. Even that, even still today, we're still, I'm still working from home because, you know, COVID's still not going away where we are in LA. It was, it was weird at first. I'm not sure if you guys felt that, but it was weird at first working from home, not going to an office office. Because the minute I got a new job in, in the pandemic, but I've never, I've never been in my office, like, I think five times total in like the last two years. It was like, hmm, <laughs> I don't even know it's anybody new. really. It's really new. Normal, right here. It is. That's interesting. But it, yeah, it, it's it's fun working from home. Okay, we got some random questions for you guys. You ready? Hit me. Okay. So first one is, what would you do if you suddenly inherited one million dollars? <laughs> I would snatch up some real estate. There um, you go. I think. Yeah, I think like I don't know. I, the market seems like a little bit inflated right now, but I am I am the kind of guy who wants to have my own land. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, have some chickens, grow some some vegetables, fruits and farm. stuff, and 
Yeah, that's yeah. that's kind of the end game for me. Like, I want to be kind of self-sustained and like some some little plot of land in the countryside in Thailand. Maybe have like a, a helicopter or something. I don't know. <laughs> I have some weird ideas. Nice. <laughs> Wait, did you say a helicopter? Yeah, I said yeah. a helicopter. Dude. I've always been kind of fascinated and intrigued by like smaller aircrafts. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. Trevor doesn't even know this, but like I would, I've always wanted like one of those one man helicopters, or like uh, I'm really into those paragliding. Um, not paragliding. Um, what's it called? The ones with the big fans on the back. Oh, parasailing. Yeah, like a parachute. It's not parasail. I think it is par paragliding. I think uh, fair sailing's off the sailing. boat, and then yeah. this one's like you have a fan, so it's like your engine. And I've always wanted like to do that. Um, anyway, just have my own spot and like a cool little aircraft that I could fly around. <laughs> that sounds pretty cool. Actually. And of course, you know, support the family. Of course, I of mean, course. I feel like that doesn't even need to be said. Yeah. Yes, yes. Buy mama house, car. Oh, yeah. for sure. Of course. Yeah, exactly. Love, love you, mom. <laughs> yeah, I gotta give her a shout out. You gotta always. What about you, Trevor? Well, uh, I have two answers for you. So I'm going to give you the realistic one mm -hmm. and the boring one that I really would do. Okay. And then I'll give you the one that I want to do. Okay. So, <laughs> so the realistic boring answer is I would just invest it and just be and just try to be really, really smart with it and be very careful with it. Okay. And just make sure that it grows, mm -hmm. actually. So it's not just a one time inheriting a, a million dollar thing. Like I want it to last a long time. Okay. Um, the second answer, though, like if there is absolutely no consequences, oh my God, I would just splurge it on traveling and just buying a lot of stupid stuff. Um, what what's what constitutes a stupid stuff? Uh, like candy, like Lamborghini. I, I would. Well, I'd, I'd probably buy a motorcycle for sure like a really nice motorcycle I, i've always wanted a motorcycle here in thailand um hell yeah i just never got around to it it's not super high on the priority list mm. um i'd spend a lot on traveling and nightlife stuff <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah that's that's what i want to do but realistically i'd try to be as smart with it as possible you can still take half and still travel around the world, or like go places you haven't been before, or go again to places you want to be. Like that's what I would do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll splurge a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> and buy a nice car and buy a nice you know motorcycle. Be fun. Go on the autobahn and go like hundred miles an hour. Oh, you know the the autobahn seems terrifying. Like, just. Is it really like you can go as fast as you want? There's no speed limit at all. As fast like, is as you that want. A, is that a myth or is that real? That's real. You can go as fast as you want. In a way, like for them, I think people who live there are used to it. So they, they just like, they just respect each other enough to go as fast as they want around each other. So they all go with the flow of traffic. No limits. Wow. Yeah. Like, well, li living here in Thailand and like, you know, driving with the traffic here, um, that seems terrifying. If if everyone can just like drive as fast as they want, but maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I wouldn't trust anyone in LA to drive as fast as they want. Never. <laughs> no. I mean, you can't yeah, because no. there's traffic everywhere here. But if there's like no limits, man, I would not drive. I take the bus. I'd Uber everywhere. <laughs> if you were to, if you were a vending machine, what would you vend? Hmm. Well, I feel like if you're a vending machine, you want to vend things that you don't like. Because you're getting rid of it. There we go. Right. Okay. So um, I'd probably vend like if there was a way to like uh, put my. Sh oh, this sounds kind of evil, though. Man, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to come off as like an evil. No, you can say it. <laughs> if there was a way to like encapsulate my stress into like a pill, and like oh, vend yeah. that, and like uh, get rid of my stress <laughs> and put it, give it to other people. I mean, they don't have to. They don't have to eat the pill. They can just toss it. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> that would be great. That's a little abstract, though. It is, but that's, I that's think a wild uh, answer. <laughs> it's a, it's a, great, it's a, wild, it's a unique answer. That's a, that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, if that, I mean, that would just be nice. But maybe I would, you know, if it was something I did like, I'd probably be vending like Skittles, just like every single every single like style of Skittle sour mm. smoothie blend, wild berry, because I'm a Skittle fanatic. <laughs> like 
Yeah, I love Skittles. They're kind of rare out here in Thailand. They only sell them in like little small packages. Do they sell, do they sell a certain kind of Tragedy. Skittles like in Thailand? Because I know like certain candy or certain food around the world is different, but like the, the different packages where they have different flavors. Like in Japan, they have like different flavors of like Snickers. Right. They don't have in America. Well, honestly, Thailand needs to get on their Skittle game a little bit more, or Skittle needs to get on their Thailand game a little ah, bit there more. There we go. There like, it is. Yeah, like they only have the red ones, and uh, really, and they're tiny little packages. So I can't really get my fix over here, but it's a good thing actually. <laughs> I'm 31. I shouldn't be like eating Skittles like yeah, at all. <laughs> it's not good for us. Well, Skittles in the are 30s. great. They are. It, I like the, I like sour. The sour Skittles are the best. I think. I like sour oh candy, God. but sour Skittles are so good. My mouth yeah. just started watering when you said that. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> and, and, and I think sour is great, but like, yeah, like this, sour Starburst, sour Skittles, sour Lifesavers, amazing. I love those hair candy so much. What, what are you, uh, Trevor? What would you vend? Well, if I was a if I was a vending machine, I would um, I would be one of those like super old school like nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties like Coke bottle machines. Ah, nice. I, I just like the nostalgia of it. I think they're just so cool. So that's I would cool just keep that. That's classic. Yeah. The classic bottles, the top, this top. Yeah. 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 It's, it's like you never see those anymore. And I want to bring it back to style. They brought it back shortly here in the, in the States. Like for like, I think like a year or two. And then like they kind of went, they're gone now. But in certain places, you can still find like in Las Vegas, you can still find them like certain places that vend it. I think it's pretty cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, here we go. What what emoji are you guys? Um, I'm the I'm the I'm the sunglasses emoji. There you go. The cool one. Because I'm so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but for me, I. There's an emoji I use a lot. It's the laughing, crying emoji. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's like a boomer thing to do, but I think it, it's a good emoji. It's it like is, a happy, positive vibes emoji. Yeah. If it is, I'm a boomer, okay? Because that's a great emoji to use. I use that a lot. That one in the, so the skull is, is like, because things are funny. I like, I like laughing at certain things. But I hear that I, that is boomer because Gen Z says that they use chair now for laughing. They use what? The chair. Like it's a chair emoji. Just literally a chair. That's the whole like, and the skull for laughing. They don't use the, the chair. I'm confused. Yeah. I was too. What? But that like, again, we sound old saying that because like ugh, you guys don't get it. Yeah, they don't. We don't get it. I mean, I, I don't understand that what chair means. Oh yeah, we don't laughing. Yeah, we sure. don't. We don't get it. We don't get it. That's their, That's a new thing they use. Yeah, like you're fall. You fell out of the chair, so the chair is just by itself. It's just by is itself. Going? Yeah, I guess so. Maybe, you know, maybe that's what it is. If that's what it is. I get it, but I don't get it. Wow, they're they're think they're playing three chess with those emojis. I'm telling you, man, they are. I, I don't understand it, but <laughs> they, they say they say that the laughing crying emoji is the old school way of doing it. We don't use that anymore. It's not cool anymore. I'm like, all right, all right, whatever. Or I still whatever. use it, so I think it's cool. Like Trevor, he's cool. Okay, I think yeah. Cool. <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, Trevor's the embodiment of the. Sunglasses emoji, just, exactly. Just oozing. <laughs> oozing, <laughs> charisma. oozing charisma, oozing cool. charisma, and, yes. and, and just coolness. Exactly. I think so. so what's I'll the best? That. Hell yeah! What's the best game you've ever played? Best game ever. Oh. Um. Well, I'm gonna have to. I think the game that had like the most impact on my time in the sense of like the amount of time I spent on it and just the wow factor of it. In my opinion, this has to be, oh, I, I have to give, I have to give two answers again. It, it's, okay. So like as not a child, I'd say it's the civilization games. Um, I, nice. I've just always loved strategy games. Mm -hmm. Oh, also into the breach. I have to mention into the breach. Um, oh, yeah, we both love into the breach. Oh my God. It's, it's such a good indie game and just a it's just an amazing strategy game just everything about it's great um but as a child i'd say the ratchet and clank series oh classic just that yeah just as like a not necessarily like a mindless gameplay but it i just felt so immersed in it and it just had a big impact on 
me, I guess, as a child. Yeah, and for me, I think um, I'll say the obvious Breath of the Wild. It's just such an, a gorgeous game that really sucks you in. A masterpiece. Um, yeah. It, it, yeah, it's, it's like a definitively a masterpiece, I think, in most people's minds and in the general public. But if I had to like, be a little bit less basic, I would probably say um, <laughs> The Stanley Parable. Have you oh, heard of that? Game. Yeah, that's a good game. I played it twice. Yeah. 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 It's, I don't know how it plays on the second playthrough, but the first playthrough, if you go into that game blind, yeah. and if you haven't played it yet, don't look it up. Don't, don't, don't read anything about it. Just mm -hmm. go in completely blind. If you go into that, that game not knowing what to expect, it can honestly change the way you think about reality mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. Like the, the philosophical stuff it goes into about like the illusion of choice and things like this. Um, and even just like how Stanley in the beginning is like working at an office and it's kind of like a drudgery and like he's pushing a button. That's not really a spoiler. It's like the, the beginning of the mm -hmm. game. Yeah. And you, you realize, damn, you kind of see yourself in Stanley a little bit. Like immediately, or at least for me, I was able to really connect with that character. And um, that game, honestly, I could say gave me like changed the way I thought about like what the, my purpose in my life is. I know it sounds super profound and things like that, but I don't know. It, it, you get whatever you get out of the game. But I just think that game made me think in a way that no other game has as far as like philosophically. Absolutely. That, that game, yeah. It's so simple too. I, I saw one trailer for it a long time ago when it first came out. I'm like, I'll try it out. But it's almost like no matter what, no matter what you do, it's gonna, the game's going to progress. And, and yeah. No matter what you do, and there's multiple endings of the game. That's why I played it twice. But it's Multiple like, is it's, an understatement, it's, right? It's, it's like tons. It's insane. Like, I, I, yeah, just play, play for yourself. I won't say what to, what to do, but I, I've done, I did certain things in the game where I thought, oh, this won't matter, but it matters. Like it, it always matters. And like the the narrator remembers certain things you do in the game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's incredible, it's... and it, it always plays out to where the way that you either have have a choice or there's not really a choice, or do you think it's a choice? But he yeah. gave you the choice, so is it really a choice? It's it, it's great. It gets great. super meta. Yeah, yeah. It, it messes with your head a lot. Yeah, it does. Absolutely does. I say yeah, absolutely play that game. The game is fantastic. So what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? May, uh, okay, just like anything else, you have to study. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I think a lot of people think, oh, it's not, this isn't, this isn't school. Like, I don't have to study. But you got to put in the work to study about game design, uh, narrative. Uh, you got to put in the work and gain this sort of collective database that game devs share. Um, and a good recommendation I have for people to listen to is GDC, which is Game Design Conference. Mm -hmm. And this basically, oh my God, the valuable, the value that I've gotten out of the GDC uh, organization has been insane. And it's, it's just all on YouTube. It's a series of lectures that some of the top video game uh, people in the video game world give these lectures about their games, specific things within the game. It could be anything from how we did this animation um, what, uh, or to like world building. Uh, narrative elements, even some like really nitty gritty programming stuff. It is like insane that this is free and out there on the internet. Uh, it's like university for game game design, basically. Nice, awesome. Um, so you got to put in the work to study all these things before you kind of jump too too heavy into it. Um, there's so much to learn, and and it's infinite, really. Mm -hmm. Um, when you're in any creative endeavor, the possibilities are infinite. Um, so it helps if you kind of have a little bit of a scope of what's possible and what people have done before you. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been to any GDC conferences? No, I, I wish. I think the last one was in 2019. Yeah. It seems that way because the videos kind of stopped. They're all like tw 2019, actually March 22nd, which is my birthday. So they're all on my birthday, 2019. But um, uh, God, I, I hope to attend one in the future. I understand they couldn't really do it because of COVID over, mm -hmm. over time. And yeah. it, it almost seems like everything's just going to shift to online now. Are we ever going to have these in-person conferences again? Um, that's something I'm really wanted to participate in as a game dev, you know? Yeah. Um, and it just seems like 
no one's really sure if it's coming back. And um, I know I know E three is coming is sad. gonna be a thing. Well, I'm probably not because of, of Omicron, but they did say they're gonna they're gonna have E three here in LA, which I'm guessing might be like limited, very limited people are gonna be there. Like creators. Yeah, and it won't be the same, developers. you know, it won't be that same energy. No. Which is kind of sad because yeah. it's it's it, it it is fun having it to be putting it only to creators and developers, but also having your friends come up with you and seeing the whole yep. community come out and just like meet different developers or play certain games that aren't out yet. It's just seeing like surprises. It's always fun. It's always fun. Yeah. But hopefully one day when everything comes down, we, we can all go to these conferences. Cause I want to go to like, like many conferences. GDC is one. I, hopefully I can get into one day, hopefully. And then there's like, you know, what is it? Um, South by Southwest. Oh yeah. That's, that's when I want to go yeah. to PAX. Like, PAX is one I really want to go to. That's where all the indie game, like I feel like all the indie developers, the indie game fans are at PAX playing those like indie games that we're gonna release like in the next next one or two years. But hopefully, yeah. Well, day. hopefully the the development for Bo lines up when everything's open again and we can we can start going to those kinds of things because that's part of the experience and I I really want to do it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That'd be awesome. And we, uh, oh yeah, go and, ahead, Trevor. Oh. Um, just, just in regards to the to the question, um, I I agree completely with everything Chris said. And the only thing I would add, when it comes to anyone wanting to be a game dev, um, or wanting to have a career in in this field, is like to keep your expectations very realistic. Mm-hmm. Like you know, you don't like you don't have to tell yourself like, oh, I'm just going to make the smallest game ever. Um, and focus on my time, all my time on that. Like you don't have to do that, but like if you if you want your first game to be a game, like a massive, for example, free to play game like League of Legends, it's mm-hmm. like hold your horses, you know. Yeah. Like you, <laughs> like you, you got to keep your expectations pretty realistic in what and what you can do. Um, yeah, I've even told straight up people asking me for advice here and there about like their game. And if it's out of if it's like a scope that I think is too crazy, like they're trying to make a MOBA, I'm like, dude, mm-hmm. unless you have insane amounts of money to hire insane amounts of staff to do that, just just do something else. Yeah, like uh, you have to be really realistic. I mean, I was more polite when I said it, but um, that's kind of <laughs> what I was thinking. Uh, yeah, no, MOBAs take like, a lot of of people to create the on- yeah, online infrastructure, well, like the character designing, the story. Like, it's a lot. It's, a, it's an ever-growing, ever-moving game. Yes. Very do ambitious. not make a MOBA as an indie developer. It's very ambitious. Yeah, I agree. It's way too ambitious. Like uh, I, just... I, I'm usually, I usually try to support people, but like in their endeavors. But don't make a MOBA as an indie dev. <laughs> They're gonna regret it. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just the thought of like programming a MOBA like stresses me out. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> like. Those games are massive. Yeah. If you're gonna make a MOBA, do it. Do it on an already existing engine, kind of like how Warcraft Three made Dota and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. that that's that's totally doable. Yes. Not an original MOBA. No. From the ground up, I'd be unless you like you, you got to that point where like, you're a company that can sustain that. Then yeah, absolutely do that. But MOBAs, you can make an action adventure game. You can make a platform game. You can make just you know an RPG, turn based game. That's good. That's a good way to start. Yeah, and like kind of kind of in line with what I just said too is like um another thing I'll add is that scope creep it's real. Scope creep is is a real thing and you have to be careful hmm. that like you know it's it's really fun to to add all these awesome mechanics and all of these um bells and whistles to your game, but hmm. you got to but you know you also have to be realistic and what your game really is and what you can and can't do and how you manage time. Hmm. Um, like for Bo, for example, there's a lot of mechanics that we, that, you know, some we, we might put into the final game, but there's a lot that we had to stop ourselves and say, Hey, okay, this is getting a bit much, yeah. you know, cause it's, it's going to have a lot of unexpected consequences that kind of like ripple throughout your game. So yeah, just be aware of scope creep. Anyone who wants to, Pursue a career in game dev. Keep it simple. Yeah. Wow. Good advice. I think we should end this uh, podcast. But f- before we do, uh, before we end here, let everyone know where they're able to find the game, wishlist it, follow it, about your Kickstarter, and where to follow you guys on your social media. 
Okay, well, uh, the hub for all of our social media is Twitter, and our Twitter tag is at Squid Shock. Squid like the animal, shock like a lightning bolt. Squid Shock. And on there, you'll find all the links in our bio, like to the link to our Kickstarter project, which is launching on February 1st. Um, please join our Discord if you want to learn more about our game. The link is also in that bio. And the Steam page is also linked there. And we have a link tree also linked there. <laughs> there's so many links. <laughs> it's a lot of links. Uh, there's too many things that we have to be on, too many <laughs> platforms. But um, whatever your preferred platform is, we try to be on there in some capacity. Um, but our, all of our links are fa uh, searchable or findable on Twitter. So Twitter, Squid Shock. That's where you got to go. And I'll, I'll link all that stuff below. So it's easy awesome. for you guys to just look for it, click on it, follow the, the Kickstarter that's coming out February 1st. By the way, congratulations on the Kickstarter. February 1st. Thank I can't you. wait to see it, see more about the game, learn more about this game. Because I got to say, those who, people, fans of platform games, fans, uh, fans of story games and a much deeper story with NPCs and the character building and lore. Definitely check this game out. It's it's gonna blow your mind. It's fantastic. I like it a lot. I'm enjoying it and following along the process. So yeah, congrats guys to making all this happen. Mark from this Thank you so much. team. Fantastic. Thank you. That's it for today guys. So another episode of uh, Only Games Podcast in the books on Kai vs the World. Be sure to subscribe and like this video, share with your friends if you enjoy this. If anyone, if anyone else who's any dev or a developer who wants to come on the show, hit me up on Twitter, Instagram. It's Kitality, K A I T A L I T Y. I'm mainly on Twitter, so find me on there. I also do Screenshot Saturday, hashtag, and the Wishlist Wednesday hashtag as well. If you're a developer, again, you want to show off your game, join me there and just show off your game. We'll talk about it. I answer every single post. Yes, I do. I'm insane. I do that. Anyways, guys. I'm in Catality. It's been an interview with Squidshot Games, Bo. Uh, keep being awesome, guys, and I'll see you guys in the next video.